Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is part two from the introduction to if the Quran by itself is enough, then how did we learn how to pray? So we carry on from where we left that Umar ibn Khattab said we don't need anything. We have the book of Allah and then the messenger of Allah told them to go away. And Abdullah ibn Abbas said the catastrophe, the huge, the whole catastrophe is that which came between Allah's messenger and the writing of his proclamation. Often time um, I, I hear this and I hear it sometimes by a lot of sheikhs and it really angers me to no end. And I hear it a lot also from people that use as an argument against me when I speak about the Quran. And that is the mentioning of a hadith. That hadith is I left amongst you two things. If you hang on to them tight, you'll never go astray, you never go away from the path of Allah, the book of Allah and my sunnah. And this is, okay, let me tell you more in details about this so that you know where you stand with this kind of things. The narrator is Abu Huraira, Yarfa'uhu ila Nabi. It is Abu Huraira who attributes this hadith to the Messenger of Allah. Where it says, Inni qad fikum shay'ain. I have left with you two things. Lan tadillu ba'dahuma abadan. You should never go astray with them ever. Kitabullah wa sunnati, the book of Allah and my sunnah. Walan yaftariqa, and they will never separate ever. Hatta yarida alayya al till they arrive on me by the basin. The basin is the place where we're gonna drink, they say, and we never get thirsty after that. Which is again something that contradicts the Quran. Because Allah says in the Quran that He creates four huge uh, rivers, and thousands of other rivers will come there, and we have rivers of uh, uh, milk and sh uh, honey and wine and water, and for us to drink. So if I don't get thirsty, how would I drink? It's, 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 it just doesn't go. You see, in Jannah we will get thirsty and we will get hungry and when we will get thirsty, w uh, drink whatever we so desire is available at any time. Let me tell you, there is nothing better when you are extremely thirsty and then you come home and you take that beautiful, nicely tasting juice that you like and you put it in your uh, mouth and it's uh, outside it's hot and you're thirsty and you're hot and you're, everything is not working for you and then climate wise of course and you come home and you take that beautiful orange juice that you like or any kind of juice and you put it in your mouth and that contact, the first contact is your tongue and you go, oh God, what oh, beautiful thing. Isn't that bliss thing? I love it when it happens. Or when I'm extremely hungry and I'm waiting for my delivery or Uber Eats or one of these things to come and then I d d d d savior my food and oh God, what beautiful thing. And then I'm thankful to Allah for that. That's what's going to happen in Jannah. Except here sometimes you don't get what you want. In Jannah you get all you want. But for us Muslims, is we're gonna, the Prophet is going to hand us a cup. We're going to drink from that cup and we will never get thirsty again. That is the Hadithic Islam. The Quran doesn't say this. The Quran tells us you get hungry, you eat. You get thirsty, you drink whatever you want. That's the bless of what Allah says. But anyhow, so this Hadith and any other which are similar to this one, all of these hadiths are weak. None of them is authentic. None of them. All the scholars of hadith in Islam agree that this hadith that, he, that the messenger said, I left amongst you the book of Allah and the sunnah, are weak. And weak is part of the fabricated hadith. There is not a single hadith, not even a single scholar that has ever authenticated this hadith not even when they want to falsify Islam they can't so the, I left amongst you the book of Allah and the hadith, sunnah of Rasulullah is a fabricated hadith to be left away altogether and it contradicts the Quran 100% and this is just an example that tells you how our sheikhs and all these people promote and prioritize the hadith over the Quran and you hear big sheikhs tell you oh I've left amongst you the book of Allah and my sunnah they lie however there is a hadith and it is authentic and works with the Quran and it's a historical hadith but you don't hear it much but the Shia they know it very well oh God yes they do here is the hadith that says Qama Rasulullah yawman fina khatib and this hadith is in Muslim, it's authentic, and many other books of hadith, so it's an authentic hadith. So one day Allah's Messenger addressed us in a sermon. 
بما إن يدعى خما بين مكة والمدينة by an oasis called خم غدير خم the oasis of خم situated between مكة and مدينة I will tell you more about these places later on yeah just let me finish the text first فحمد الله وأثنى عليه ووعظ وذكر ثم قال he praised Allah i.e. the messenger praised Allah and glorified Allah then he forewarned us and reminded us and then he said so he, he did exactly what Allah he gave us the good news and he warned us about the judgment day and then he said أما بعد thereafter ألا أيها الناس فإنما أنا بشر you people certainly I am just but a human being يوشك أن يأتي رسول ربي فأجيب who is about to receive Allah's messenger i.e. the angel of death to whom I shall obey وأنا تارك فيكم ثقلين and I am about to live with you two heavy things two heavy responsibilities أولهما كتاب الله the first of which is the book of Allah فيه الهدى والنور in which there is guidance and light فخذوا بكتاب الله so take from the book of Allah and hold on tight to it واستمسكوا به فحث على كتاب الله ورغب فيه ثم قال then he insisted on us to hold on fast to the book of Allah and gave us incentives about it then added وأهل بيتي أذكركم الله في أهل بيتي and the second are the members of my household i.e. Ali, Fatima, Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein I remind you about the members of my family أذكركم الله في أهل بيتي I remind you of your duties about the members of my family and the third time I remind you of the duties about my family and as I said this is in Muslim and uh, other uh, people and this goes with the ayah قل لا أسألكم عليه أجر say I do not ask of you any payment for the Islam that I brought to you the Quran all the kind of thing إلا المودة في القربة except that you become loving and respectful and helpful to my near kin and these are here Al-Qurba the members of the family i.e. Fatima and then her husband and his cousin Ali and the members of the household of Rasulullah this hadith is authentic you don't hear it but the Shia keep banging on it I'm banging on it and the Sunnis they keep hiding it hiding it hiding it but they promote Kitabullah wa Sunnati and it's a lie the first one, Kitabullah Sunnati, is a lie. This, as I said, I have promised you to speak more about the, the place and where this hadith, the oasis of Khum. When Rasulullah, in the last 90 days of his life, when he went to perform Hajj, because after that, uh, I will mention the ayah later on, after Allah had received, uh, has revealed to the Prophet Muhammad that he perfected Islam and end of it, no halal and no haram was made. For the last 90 days of the life of the messenger, he, he didn't receive any halal or haram texts. On the way from Mecca to al Madinah, he came to a place called Khum. Khum is an oasis and it's well known as I said to the Shia but totally un uh, sadly unknown to us even though many books have been written about this event that took place at that time because it is an extremely important event that's hidden from us. So but anyhow, so when he got to this oasis of Khum, he stopped there. And then he asked the companions to take a rest and they did that and then he uh, asked them to build him kind of like a pedestal so he could stood up and people could hear him and then he did that and they did that and then later on he called all the companions and then they said there were around a hundred thousand of them and he started speaking and of what he said he said this one here that uh, I am just a human being and I'm going to die and uh, I'm asking you to stick to the book of Allah and he spoke greatly of the book of Allah and then he told them about uh, taking care of his household and this is why uh, it's important because also in this event he called Ali and he held the hand of Ali and he told the people that whoever man kana wali whoever is my uh, supporter who is my follower Ali should be his supporter and his follower and the Shia used this to say that when the Prophet fell sick he was going to endorse what he said in the oasis of Khum to put Ali in authority and the Sunnis say no we don't know that we have no clue whatsoever but anyhow as you can see in the last 
or less than 90 days before the death of Allah's messenger, his words were to push people and encourage them to hold on tight to the Quran and implement its teachings. And he never ever pushed for his own what's known today as hadith and sunnah and things like that. It's incredible. So let's go back to our essential question because I keep going back to it so that you can see and put it in context. If the Quran by itself was enough, how did we then learn how to pray? My dear sisters and my brothers, this talk is by far the hardest that I ever had to give. It's the hardest research I've made in my life and it's the most hard responsible talk that I'm going to give because it puts the Quran and Allah at stakes. If I don't deliver in this talk, someone will just abandon the Quran and this is a huge responsibility. Really, really, it's a huge responsibility. And it also, as I said uh, earlier on, that Allah did put himself in many times in the Quran in the same equation as the Quran. The fall of one means the fall of the other. So if I don't deliver, it means that Allah has not delivered, the Quran has not delivered, and this is a huge responsibility. This is why I ask and I beg of you to pay a huge deal of attention at what I am going to say in this series. Because as I said, your Quran is at stakes and your trust in Allah and the trust in Allah's word will be put to test. You see, when Allah completed and terminated Al-Islam, the messenger was still alive. What this means is anything added after the death of the messenger is not considered part of Al-Islam. Just like you write your will when you are alive and you sign it and you finish. Then one, when you die, if someone adds to your will, it's not you who wrote it. It has been added. And that is exactly what happened to Allah's religion. Al-Islam was completed, terminated, and the messenger was still alive. And as I said, this, okay, the ayah that I am going to study now with you is also in Surah Al-Ma'idah, the one that was, the, the surah that was revealed in the last 90 days of the messenger life. But there is no better way of telling you the story than what's going to happen in Bukhari and Muslim and this story here. One day Umar ibn al-Khattab being the president of the Muslims or as they call him the Khalifa, Amir al-Mu'mineen, the, the Amir of the believers, a Jew, a Jewish man came to Umar ibn al-Khattab and told him, Ya Umar, if you have one surah in your Quran, if it was revealed to us, we would have made it a celebration, a Eid. And Umar ibn al-Khattab said, uh, what surah, uh, what ayah is that? And the Jewish girls, Al-Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum, and he tells him the ayah that I'm going to tell you about now. And Umar says, oh, I know when it was revealed, where it was revealed, and for us is a huge deal about this ayah. And this, is, this hadith is in Al-Bukhari. And what Umar meant here is this. This ayah was revealed on the Mount of Arafah. When the messenger was on Arafah and Allah had perfected Islam at that moment there because Allah of the last rules that Allah ordered on us were of Hajj. So when Allah finished with Hajj and there was nothing to add to Islam of Halal and Haram, when the messenger was standing on Arafah, Allah revealed to him this ayah. Al-Yawm, this day, Today, أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ I completed for you your religion. وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي And concluded upon you my favor, i.e. the completion of Islam. وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا And I'm pleased for you, your Islam, the one that you have now, as your religion. And this ayah in Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayah Ma'idah number 5, and the ayah is number 3. This ayah, my dear sisters and my brothers, is extremely, extremely, extremely important. 
And in the books of Tafsir, they always report that this ayah has a very significant meaning, so much so that most of them always report the hadith that is in Al-Bukhari about Omar and how much of value and how magnificent this ayah is. If a Jewish person goes to Omar and tell him, Chief of Believers, this is an, uh, there is an eye on your book, and which is really read by all of you Muslims, and had it been revealed to us, we would have taken that day on which it was revealed as a day of celebration. And Omar said, of course, which eye is it? And then the Jewish tell him, it's the day I perfected your religion. And Omar replied, indeed, we certainly know when, when and where this ayah was revealed to the messenger. It was on Friday, on the, and the messenger was on Arafah in the Hijjah. My dear sisters and my brothers, if Allah reveals this Quran, where the hundreds of thousands of companions were with the messenger in Mecca, the messenger, because Arafah, all people must be in Arafah at the same time. It's not like the Tawaf, you do it in the afternoon, in the morning, at your leisure or Mina. No, Arafah, everybody must be in Arafah. And in the books of history, they always say that with the messenger, there were over 120,000 companions. And when Rasulullah gave the sermons and gave all that, so all of them heard what the messenger said. And they also heard the last of what Allah revealed in this Quran. Today, I have completed for you your religion and concluded upon you my favor. And I am pleased for you, the Islam that I have completed and favored, as your religion. Everybody after that never went home and said, Oh, what does the messenger say? What's the hadith and what's the sunnah? To them they understood all the Islam was in the Quran. They were not like us. They were not ducks. They were not uh, just like muttons and all these cattle following whatever is being told to them. They knew the Quran was the Islam. And anything that is in the Quran is Islam. If someone tells me it's haram to eat with your left hand, and I go, is it in the Quran? He goes, no. I said to him, go away. This should have been our case. It should never ever been, oh, the messenger ate with the right hand, it's sunnah. I don't care about that. I care if it's haram or halal. If it's halal, if Allah has not forbade it, then I'm allowed to eat with my left hand and of it. The messenger has chosen to eat with his right hand, that's him. Just like if he chose to write with his left hand, I, should, I don't have to learn how to write with my left hand. You see, for those of you who haven't been to Hajj, the day of Arafah is, as I said, is the day where everybody gets there. More than that, Allah testifies, and this is an incredible move, where Allah testifies that the Quran contains the knowledge and the Islam that Allah wants mankind to have. Would Allah testify on something that's not enough and that is defective and that is 300 years later on will be added to? then this puts Allah in a very awkward situation. He's swearing about something and he's not even aware that 300 years later is going to happen. Or if he was aware that 300 years from now people would add, then how come he swears today on something that has completed? Listen to what Allah's testimony says. Inna ilayk. We surely have revealed to you. كما أوحينا إلى نوح والنبيين من بعده just as we revealed to Nuh and the prophets after him وأوحينا إلى إبراهيم وإسماعيل وإسحاق ويعقوب والأسباط and we revealed to Ibrahim and Ismail and Ishaq and Yaqub and Al-Asbat and these are the grandchildren of Israel وعيسى وأيوب ويونس وهارون وسليمان and عيسى أيوب يونس هارون and سليمان وآتينا داود زبور and we granted داود David the scripture of الزبور the Psalms the Psalms ورسلا قد قصصناهم عليك من قبل and messengers whose stories we have told you already before i.e. Allah has revealed to them ورسلا لم نقصصهم عليك and other messengers of whom we have not told you anything Yet Allah has revealed to them as well. And then Allah adds, وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمًا And to Musa, Allah spoke directly and truly. Then after Allah named all these beautiful people, the prophets with, to whom he has revealed, then Allah describes their job description, what was their function. He says, رُسُلًا مُبَشِّرِينَ وَمُنذِرِينَ Messengers sent as bearers of good news and as warners. 
None of these messengers was sent as a legislator. Countless ayat highlight their function of these prophets and messengers just as being warners and givers of good news. That's all. And then Allah explains why he sent all these prophets and why he revealed to them and everything so that people would never have any proof against Allah after the coming of the messengers on judgment day no one is gonna say yeah Allah you know what I never heard of that yes some people especially in our time for example in the Amazon or parts of the world where they have not heard of the Prophet Muhammad as it should that these people are exempt but most of the people before had had a messenger that came to them and Allah is ever all powerful all protector after all this after all the messengers that Allah mentioned Allah lays bare his testimony statement and here is where Allah is called to the witnesses bar and Allah is going to witness and then Allah says لكن الله يشهد بما أنزل عليك yet Allah is witness to what he has sent down to you أنزله بعلمه he descended it with his knowledge Ibn Kathir in his tafsir of this particular ayah states the following. I'm gonna just bring the translation of what he says. He says, the Quran contains Allah's knowledge, a knowledge that Allah wanted to share with his subservience. In the Quran are evidences, guidance, and the difference between what Allah loves and pleases and what he hates and refuses. And what's in it, i.e. in the Quran, is the knowledge of the khayb, i.e. the unseen, the things that we cannot see, that which can't be seen from the past or the future. And then Allah says, وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ يَشْهَدُونَ And the angels also, they testify that what Allah has sent down, He has sent down from Allah, and in it is the knowledge of Allah, i.e. in the Quran is the knowledge of Allah. The angels know that in the Quran is what Allah wants from us. And then Allah says, وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا And it is enough that Allah alone is the witness. But as is the case, not everyone shall believe or accept Allah's witnessing. And for those who reject the Qur'an under any pretense, they have got a special message from Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفُرُوا As for those who covered by rejecting the Qur'an, وَصَدُّوا عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ and then deviate others and they push others from the Qur'an قَدْ ضَلُّوا ضَلَالًا بَعِيدًا they certainly have strayed with a certain loss this ayah is in Surah An-Nisa that is Surah number 4 and the ayah from 163 to 167 by the way the An-Nisa does not mean the women if you go to Surah number 4 in your Quran in English in the translation you're gonna say that it's called An-Nisa i.e. the women it's not it does not speak An-Nisa here comes from An-Nisyan An-Nisyan is the forgetting or the delaying the laws that are in this surah were not in the Torah or the gospel or other Allah delayed them to the Quran so if we want to know what's different from the Quran and the other books all we have to do is come to the surah number four if if I had to give a title different than this I would call it the deferred or the delayed laws but anyhow in conclusion as you can see my dear sisters and my brothers Allah not only does he take the Quran extremely seriously but he testifies and told us that lots of knowledge is treasured inside it and this knowledge is for us humans that believe in Allah and we believe also that Allah has uh, buried treasures in his book for us to discover as we go along in this life is it possible that Allah teaches us the Qibla in the Qur'an and teaches us the Wudu in the Qur'an, teaches us how to pray when we are scared or a state of war and he doesn't teach us how to do, perform the Salat itself? Allah when he was talking about the Qibla gives us precise instruction on how to find out the Qibla. For every nation there is a direction to which they face in their prayers. So race towards good deeds. 
We should compete with the Jews in doing good deeds, and we should compete against the Christians, against the Buddhists. We should be better than with them at doing good deeds. And then Allah says, وَمِنْ حَيْثُ خَرَجْتَ And from wherever you come out, ya Muhammad, فَوَلِّ وَجْهَكَ شَطْرَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ Then turn your face in the direction of the sacred mosque, i.e. المسجد الحرام, الكعبة, مكة. وَإِنَّهُ لَلْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكَ And it surely is the truth from your Lord, from us. وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِرٍ عَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ And Allah is not unaware of what you do. And then he added, وَمِنْ حَيْثُ خَرَجْتَ And from wherever you come out, فَوَلِّ وَجْهَكَ شَطْرَ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ Then turn your face towards Al-Kaaba. وَحَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُمْ And wherever you believers may be, فَوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ شَطْرَةً Then turn your faces towards it. And this is in Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah 2, Ayah 148, all the way to 150. There is not a single hadith in which the messenger tells us where to turn to pray. He didn't say, oh, turn your faces to Al-Kaaba. He didn't. Why? All he did was to apply this ayah. He turned his face towards Al-Qibla, towards Mecca, and people followed him. That's exactly what he did. So the question to ask here is, would Allah teach us the Qibla direction and not Salat? This is incredible thinking. Secondly, Allah teaches us the wudu, the ablution that we perform when we want to do our salat. Allah says, Ya ayu alladhina amanu, you who believe, idha qumtum ila salat, when you stand up for your salat, when you perform your prayer, faghsilu wujuhakum wa aidiyakum ila al-marafiq, then wash your faces and your hands up to the elbows. وَمْسَحُوا بِرُؤُوسِكُمْ وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ وَأَرْجُلُكُمْ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ And wipe your, uh, your, uh, the heads and your legs to the ankles. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ جُنُوبًا فَاتَّهَرُوا And if you are passers by, then you should cleanse yourself. And then he says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ مَرْضَىٰ أَوْ عَلَىٰ سَفَرٍ And if any of you is sick or on a trip, أَوْ جَاءَ أَحَدٌ مِّنْكُمْ مِنَ الْغَائِطِ Or one of you has come back from the toilet, what do we do? Or we lamest to Manisa, or we have had intercourse with our partners. Falam tajidu. And by the way, lamest to Manisa. It doesn't mean you touch women as they translate it. It, it, it. it doesn't mean this. Because then women are exempt from this. What Allah says, lamest to Manisa. When you are single, you are one. Your partner that you're gonna marry come after you. When you fall in love with your partner, your fa partner was never with you. You met them later on. And same thing for a woman. When she's single, she's by herself. And then when she falls in love, when she meets her partner, the partner comes after her. So when Allah says, لا مستم النساء, i.e. when you touch those you get involved with later on as partner, not as women. He's not talking about women at all. But in the books of you, if you go in this surah here, uh, in sort of... Uh, Sorry, in Surah, let me get you the right uh, for, uh, in Al Ma'ida in the Ayah 3, you will find that they, they, they talk about women, but it's not that. But anyhow, and then Allah goes and He says, if you don't find water, ف, ف, in case you don't find water, then seek clean earth. And wipe over your faces and hands with it. Allah does not wish to place upon you any difficulty or any burden, but would you and but would want to purify you and would perfect his favors or grace upon you so that you be thankful. And then Allah says, and commemorate Allah's favors upon you and the covenant he made with you when you said we heard and obeyed. And be mindful of Allah, surely Allah knows best what is hidden in the hearts. And this is in uh, Surah Al-Ma'idah, number 5, and the ayah number 3. As you can see, Allah goes in all these details about wudu. If you're not this, and if you're sick, if you're on a trip, and if you come back from the uh, toilets, if you sleep with your partners, if you can't find water, then wash this, and do that, and do this, and do that, and do this, and do that. So... The question is, would Allah teach us all this about the Qibla direction and the detail the wudu as he did and the Qibla, but not teach us Salat? Ain't something, something is not right in our thinking process. But let's carry on, because Allah teaches us the Salat times as well. And he goes in details. Inna salat kant ala al-mu'minina kitab al-mawquta. A salat is certainly a duty on time. On the believers, i.e. we should do it on its time, we practice it in its time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to us about the time of Fajr, Maghrib and Isha. 
And for your information, and I will come back to you at one other point, not in this talk here, that Allah mentions only three salat. And I will explain one day uh, when I talk about the salat and their times and everything, why Fajr is recited loud, Maghrib is recited loud, and Isha is loud, but Dhuhr and Isha are silent. And I'll tell you why. Because in the third century when they differed, is Dhuhr and Asr, are they part of the, uh, the five daily prayers or not? They differed. They were not sure. At-Tabari Ibn Kithir and many other books they said that in Islam there are only three prayers Fajr, Maghrib and Isha and they were doubtful about Magh Dhuhr and Asr that's why they made them silent and then they went and invented hadith so that people uh, performed Dhuhr and Asr they told you Dhuhr is when the hellfire is being braised and the fire is revived of course hellfire doesn't exist now it's not being created and then they tell you Asr if you don't pray Asr then all your actions are made void it's a lie But why this hadith, this type of hadith exists? So that people pray the Asr and Lord and they don't dispute them. And as I said, I will explain later on uh, what are the salat that Allah has put on us in the Quran and there are only three salats, Fajr, Maghrib and Isha. I personally, when I pray Fajr, I pray it as a duty, Maghrib as a duty, Isha as a duty. But Dhuhr and Asr, I combine them together and I pray them as an extra prayer. I don't pray them as a duty. And this is a different. But anyhow, this is a talk. Uh, this is a point for another day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then in the Quran tells the Prophet Muhammad about the timings of Salat. For example, he tells the Prophet Muhammad, وَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ I.e. perform the Salat before the rising of the sun and before it sets. In another ayah, he tells him at night. Okay, so there are many ayat and I want to keep this talk a little bit shorter. I don't want to go in, uh, too in details, otherwise it's going to end up in, in, in hundreds of pages and I don't want to do that. So the question to ask, would Allah teach us the Qibla direction in the details he did? The wudu with the details he did? The salat timings? in the details we did and he didn't say it once or twice about the timings of Salat Allah knows it's, it's more than 20 ayat in the Quran where Allah explains the Fajr and Isha and Maghrib prayers and he did that really minutely well detailed so do you think Allah is going to tell me how to turn my face how to perform my wudu and the timings where I should pray and then he doesn't tell me how to pray do you think that is the case So do you think the question of if the Qur'an by itself is enough, then how did we learn how to pray? Is, is, is this a valid question to ask? Of course not. Let's carry on. Allah teaches us how to pray while in a state of fear. If we are in a fight or we are being chased or in a situation where you are afraid. And I'm going to hear the, the, this ayah is in Surah An-Nisa, the, the, the Surah number 4 of the deferred rules. In the ayah 102, I'm just going to read the English here so that I save on time. And if you were with them, and he's talking to the Prophet Muhammad, وَإِذَا كُنْتَ فِيهِمْ فَأَقَمْتَ لَهُمُ الصَّلَاةِ And if you are with them, and you were to lead them in prayer, فَلْتَقُمْ طَائِفَةٌ مِّنْهُمْ مَعَكَ وَلِأَخُذُ أَسْلِحَتَهُمْ Let a group of them stand with you to worship, to perform salat, keeping their arms, their weapons with them. Then when they have performed their prostration, the sujood, then let them fall back to the rear. So Allah is explained to Rasulullah to, to divide his groups, to pray with this one and pray, then these ones they pray the two and the other ones. So Allah explains it exactly how they should pray. And guess what? Even though these questions were clear, we still ask the question, Oh, if the Quran by itself is uh, enough, how did we learn how to pray? Allah taught us the direction of the Qibla. How to perform wudu to a great details, the salat timings, and even how to pray when we are in a state of fear. But my dear sisters and my brothers, b before going to the Quran about the salat, how, how about finding out the history of salat in the hadith? How, is the, how did the salat get in there? How did it become part of Al-Islam? How the different parts that we perform in a salat are part of Al-Islam? How is the tashahud? How did it come to be this tashahud? How did we learn it? How, how, uh, how has the tashahud made it in our salat? Just like somebody said, oh, if the Quran by itself is enough, how did you learn how to make tashahud? And if this person who asked this question or tried to put this obstacle in front of us knew exactly how the child got here, they should never 
never open their mouths, but that's the price of ignorance. And when people speak ignorantly about the, the book of Allah, and they try to knock down the Quran from being the sole authority, even Allah has said it in hundreds of ayat, it is. Then we have a huge problem, and that problem is people speaking with ignorance. Because when I talk about the tashahud, you're really gonna, this is inshallah in part two, you're really gonna scratch your head. And you're gonna say, what? And I pray to Allah that there is light in that. My dear sisters and my brothers, you will find probably hard to believe that 300 years later, when they documented the salah, they wrote it down because everything written today about the Islam, Bukhari, Muslim, and all, everything that you know was written 300 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. Before those 300 years, people used to just do. They didn't document. Yes, there is one here, one there, but it was not the mainstream. And people wouldn't go back to these people and say, oh, what, have, what have you written? It was completely ignored. It's only in the 3rd century, in the Al-Asr al-Dhahabi, as they call it, the, the golden age of the Abbasi, the first era, or the first age of the Abbasi, and when they documented this. And I'm going to mention to you a couple hadiths that will explain or will show you that by the time Islam was documented, lots of it got forgotten. Yes, forgotten. Lots of it got forgotten. Look at this hadith. Imran ibn Hussain. Imran ibn Hussain is a well-known companion. He said that he salla ma'a Ali bil Basra. One day Ali, who, uh, Imran ibn Hussain, who used to live in Damascus, where Muawiyah was, Syria today and Mecca and all these places, they were under the leadership of Muawiyah. However, Ali was in Al Basra. And uh, you know the fight that took place between Ali and uh, Muawiyah. The people in Al Basra, in Al Iraq, and for the, until today, they have differences. There is always a difference between the people of Al Iraq and the people of Al Kufa and Al Basra, and all. There are differences between even the, the cities. But this Amran ibn Hussein, uh, Hussein prayed, went to Al Basra, and he was in the masjid, and he prayed, and Ali was the Imam. And then when he finished his salat, this Imran ibn Hussain said something. And this hadith is reported by Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani in Fath al-Bal. And also is reported in Muslim. Imran ibn Hussain said this, that Ali had reminded us of a prayer we used to pray with Allah's Messenger. Subhanallah. So Imran ibn Hussain acknowledges that he and of course the, the, his likes had forgotten a prayer that they used to pray with Rasulullah. Uh, how far? Uh, Ali was in the last uh, 35 years. Ali died in year 40. So it's like 40 years. Uh, take the 10 years uh, before the death. So we have t 30 years after the death of Rasulullah. The, uh, many of the companions had forgotten how to pray. Yes, they had forgotten. Because each, there was not a university teaching everybody. The messenger prayed, people saw him how they prayed, and that's that. He didn't hold the halaqa, weekly talks, explain the salat. He didn't do that, the prophet. He is a messenger. He just delivers the message. It's not his duty to be a teacher. And this is what people fail to understand. Prophet Muhammad never ever came to be our teacher. He is just our messenger, Allah's messenger, Allah's means to relate the Qur'an to us, then we study the Qur'an, and Islam is an individual religion, not a school of thought or a community religion, as is the case today. But anyway, so here Imran ibn Hussain says that Ali has reminded us of a prayer. We used to pray with Allah's Messenger. Of course, do you think that the scholars, uh, the Sunni scholars, our Sunni scholars, would sit and find with that? No. They had, because this is a dangerous statement. They wanted to go ahead and find out what exactly uh, happened. And then they said, oh, what exactly happened was that uh, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wouldn't say Allahu Akbar. And I will deal with this more when I speak about the Salat, the parts of the Salat that are part that exist in our Salat. I.e. Rasulullah only said, Allahu Akbar. Okay? And then the companions, what they used to do, they just would say, Allahu Akbar, to start the Salat. And they wouldn't say, Allahu Akbar, then make Rukua. Allahu Akbar, then sujood. Allahu Akbar, sit down. Allahu Akbar, sujood. Allahu Akbar, stand. You know those Allahu Akbars? Okay, they were not doing them. But Ali 
was doing it. So Imran ibn Hussain, when he heard Ali doing it, he goes, oh, by the way, yes, we used to do this with Rasulullah. And this is 30 years after the death of Rasulullah. In another hadith reported by Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, and this hadith is reported in Musnad Ahmad and uh, in uh, Al-Tahawi, and this is a, uh, the chain of narratives is authentic. So Abu Musa al-Ash'ari says, Dhakkarana Ali, Ali has reminded us of a prayer we used to pray with Rasulullah. Imma nasaynaha, either we forgot it, وَإِمَّا تَرَكْنَاهَا عَمْدًا or we abandoned it deliberately this is an extremely dangerous statement what Abu Musa al-Ash'ari says that when he prayed with Ali Ali prayed in a manner and then Abu Musa al-Ash'ari is speaking about him and the companions because they were not doing what Ali has done and he said it's either we forgot it or we just didn't want to do it and they deliberately meant not to do what the messenger did and this makes you uh, shows you that what the, our sheikh said we have to follow the sunnah we have to follow the sunnah is a lie is a huge conspirational lie because the companion says deliberately we didn't want to follow that that's why later on Abu Huraira in a hadith authentic hadith by At-Tabarani Abu Huraira said inna awwala man taraka takbir muawiyah the first to have abandoned the takbirs between the our salats, for example, from the ruku or when you make the sujood and the, the Allahu Akbar, we keep saying, not the first one, the other ones. The first one to have abandoned the takbir was Muawiyah. And the reason all this happened, my sisters, and the salat we pray today and all this kind of stuff is because of the politicization of a salat in the early days of Islam. Congregational salat or salat al jamaa in the masjid. And people tell you that you have to pray, it's compulsory things. I wasted so many years going to the masjid where I could have done other things and prayed at home. But anyhow, in the four school of thoughts, in the Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i and Hanbali and behind those uh, a huge number of sheikhs and scholars, they all agree that praying in the masjid is only a sunnah. You want to do it, do it, you don't want to do it, you don't, no problem. So how did it become compulsory? For two men, Ibn Hazm, and this man Ibn Hazm died in the year 456 uh, in, in the Christian calendar is 1064, almost a thousand years ago as of 2020. And Ibn Taymiyyah, who also died in 1328, that's around 700 years ago as of 2020, it's these two men that says praying, that said praying in the masjid is compulsory. And then what happened when, uh, and that stayed like that, and then Ibn Taymiyyah's teachings, Ibn Hazm teachings, Ibn Hazm teachings went away and the school of thoughts were ruling and everything, and until 1792, almost 230 years ago, when a man called Muhammad ibn Saud, and that is the first founder of what's known today as Saudi Arabia, when he started wanting to build and he started fighting tribes and killing, he needed a religious justification. Came in the stage Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. And guess what? The two men put their hands. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab of the Al Sheikh family provided the religious fatwas and support. Muhammad ibn Saud, the political, provided the armies and the killings. And both of them founded Saudi Arabia. That's why today the alliance is still going on. Those who rule are the kings of Al Saud. Those who rule the religion are the Al Sheikh. If you go today, you'll be totally ashamed that the man of Al Sheikh, who is today the head of the Islamic institution in Saudi Arabia, can't string two Arabic words together. But he praises Al Saud, supports them unequivocally, without any question, asking, oh God, it's, it's incredible. But, but in the early days of Islam, at the time of Muawiyah, the only way to control the masses, guess what? Was through the Salat. Banu Umayyah were the ones, and that is the, from the year 30, and it carried on until our days today. The Islam, the Sunni, are practicing what we, I, I'm not, but uh, I consider myself a follower of the Quran, but in the Sunni world, the Islam that is followed today 
is the Islam written by Banu Umayya 30 years after. I want to say written, not documented. Documented happened 300 years. Written, i.e. inaugurated, followed, and all that kind of stuff. Banu Umayya were the ones to have pushed for congregational salat to be made compulsory on all people in their kingdom. And to reinforce this order, they issued the following decrees reported with fatwas and made up hadiths and things like that. Whoever is late for congregational salat is a hypocrite. And for that they invented hadiths that you have to be earlier, you sit, you wait for salat and all these are lies. The messenger would never ever speak that. But for you not to be considered a hypocrite, don't go at the time of Dhar. Go half an hour before Dhar, you pray whatever they call the Sunnah, things like that. You sit in the masjid and you wait for Salat. Okay, so that's that. And they made that act of you sitting and waiting for Salat as more better and more uh, rewardful than going in Jihad. And later on they tell you Jihad is the toppest of what you can do. And here is Salat more than Jihad. It's a contradiction. Point number two of the laws that Banu Umayya issued, being a hypocrite, makes the blood, your blood, halal. I.e. if someone is killed, then there is no sin in that. Many people have been killed. Many people have been killed. If not killed, then his house and property should be set on fire. And they invented the hadith that Rasulullah, they say, said, Oh, were it not because of this, I would have taken a, a bunch of wood and would have gone to the houses of people who sit in their houses and would set them on fire on them. It's a lie. The Prophet Muhammad is a mercy to mankind. Why would he do that? But anyhow, but anyhow uh, the, in our fatwas today, as long as no kids or women are present in the side, inside, if there are kids and, and women inside, don't burn the house. But if someone is living alone, by, like myself, then go ahead, burn the house for me, because I'm a hypocrite. Number four, and it's at the time of Banu um Umayyah, the closure of shops at times of Salat. They had an army of enforcers that would walk the streets and if your shop is opened, then you'll be punished. And guess what? This stayed in Saudi Arabia until our days or maybe since the coming of Muhammad ibn Salman, things have changed a little bit. Otherwise, for the last until few days ago <laughs> it's still in Saudi Arabia and I've seen it with my eyes in Hajj when the uh, Salat is called you find like patrolling police military, uh, not uh, religious police they walk in the streets and uh, once he was insulting an Indian I told him what's your problem Why, if he doesn't want to pray who are you to tell him that but no in our Islam not only you must pray but you must pray on our terms and conditions and of course, to give authority to, to killing people and terrorizing people and all that kind of stuff, of course, all happens in the name of religion, but what's really meant are politics. They invented a huge lie, really a huge lie that Allah didn't say in the Quran. And they said, and this is in our books of fiqh, and they, it's debated and it's argued, but it exists. Man ta'amada tarka salat, whosoever delays their salat deliberately, حتى يخرج وقتها until its time has gone out فهو كافر he is a كافر and to substantiate this madness they mention a statement made by a great Salafi Sheikh as they call him Ishaq ibn Rahawi or Rahawi whichever way you go who said that the companions had unanimously agreed that any who deliberately delays Salat until its time has gone is a kafir who left the Islamic nation. Of course, this is so untrue, but the impact of this, 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 this horrible fatwa has hit, in, has hit us hard and it still is hitting us hard today. That's, uh, the other day I saw on Facebook somebody by Ibn Baz, anyone who doesn't pray is a kafir and he put it in a nice colored thing, just like that, kafir, kafir. Uh, according to the Salafis, we all should go to hellfire because either we are innovators or we are kuffar. But it's, it's, it's the, and I don't want to go much in details on these things, my dear sisters and my brother. And with this, I want to conclude this uh, talk as uh, they say on this bombshell as in Top Gear. I want to conclude this first installment and we'll see you at the next one where I will speak about the Salat, how, 
the way we perform it and to find out wh what we do, what, wh where does it originate from? When we say Allahu Akbar at the beginning of the Salat, why don't we say Subhanallah? Why don't we say Alhamdulillah and at the end, why we say Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah? Why don't we say, for example, Alhamdulillah? Why don't we say Allahu Akbar? If I stood in a Salat and I said, Subhanallah, or I said Bismillah, instead of Allahu Akbar, and at the end of the Salat I say Allahu Akbar, would my Salat be accepted? See, we shall find out in the next installment, uh, and in the next installment we shall find a lot of surprises. And I will speak about the tashahad and why we say this, and why we say that, and why we say Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la, Subhana Rabbi al -Azim. and people who can't speak English, can we say it in Arabic, and, uh, can't speak Arabic, sorry, can we say it in English, can we say it in the native language, and things like that. But anyhow, all these things will be covered up in installment number two. Installment number three, I will speak about Al-Isra and al mi the journey in the had it happened had it not happened and if it had it what happened to it and if it hadn't why it's with us today and installment number four I will tell you how the Quran has taught us how to pray and how the Prophet Muhammad has applied just applied what the Quran taught us until that moment there my dear sisters and my brothers you be in the mercy of Allah and I pray this first installment will open your eyes and prepares you to what's coming up next because what's coming up next should cement your belief in Al-Quran, should place the Quran as the sole and only authority and in the future we should not get married according to the Sunnah, we should get married according to the Quran and we should get divorced according to the Quran, we should inherit according to the Quran, we should fast according to the Quran, we should pray according to the Quran, we should uh, do whatever Hajj according to the Quran because at the end of the day that's exactly what the messenger of Allah did he acted on the Quran and that's why as is the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim when um, a man a companion uh, sorry not a companion a follower of the companion went to our mother Aisha when he grew and became a young man and he heard so much about the messenger he went to our mother Aisha and wanted to ask her and he goes uh, uh, I want to ask you about the messenger of Allah tell me something about him and uh, that I can follow to be exactly like him she told him كان خلقه القرآن his morals, his behavior, his etiquette, his attitude was Al-Qur'an. And in other uh, translation of the same hadith, or other version of the same hadith, she says, كان قرآن يمشي على وجه الأرض. He was a Qur'an walking on earth. So if the Qur'an was walking on earth, where did we get all this sunnah and these headaches that have driven us in thousands upon thousands miles long or kilometers long of pure darknesses? And we are still waiting to see the end of the tunnel. And the end of the tunnel has always been in our backpack, the Qur'an. Until my next talk, I leave you with the mercy and in the mercy of Allah. This is again your brother, Abdus Salam. And uh, if you want to more about my talks, please go to YouTube channel. It's uh, Islam Pep Talk. You'll have around 200 of my talks. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.